now, I am super excited uh, to welcome Teresa Carlson here to Cloud Unity. So, Teresa, if you want to maybe come off of video and of mute. Uh, first, how are you? I'm great, Brian. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Awesome. Well, First and foremost, uh, I know there's a lot of folks here that probably do know who you are, but for the folks that maybe aren't familiar, uh, do you mind just giving people just a little overview of your background? Yep, yeah, of course. Uh, well, I have, uh, like you said, most recently I was at Splunk for about a year. And uh, prior to that, I was the president and chief growth officer at Splunk, which was just amazing to be there. And then I was at Amazon Web Services for 11 years almost. I left there in April of 2021, where I was the vice president of worldwide public sector and regulated industries. Uh, and then before that, for 10 years, I was at Microsoft Federal. I was, I was vice president of Microsoft Federal. So I spent a big, big portion of my career uh, working in the public sector space around the world in uh, regulated industry. I love the enterprise space. Uh, and one of the reasons, Brian, when you asked me to come today, I was excited because Partners had been and is part, such a big part of my strategy uh, throughout my career. And now I'm the uh, non-executive chair and founder, co-founder of Night Swan, which is an acquisition core. We're uh, working to acquire company or companies that we can help take public and make sure that they have the both capital and support on scale to grow the business and help support our defense and national security space. So it's exciting to be here. Thank you for asking me. Well, Teresa, thank you for accepting that invitation. Uh, again, really uh, honored to have you here. Um, you know, so first and foremost, um, we do want this to be an interactive session. So if folks have questions, right, feel free to go ahead and ask those in the chat. Uh, I'll tee a couple of these off first, um, but you know, one of the first things that when we were kind of planning today and looking back even on our past Cloud Unity events, uh, one of the major initiatives that a lot of organizations and our customer base and our partner base is, is helping with is multi-cloud. Uh, now, you know, I know that a lot of people have a perception that that's a taboo word at AWS. Uh, we chatted a few days ago about that. I'm just curious, you know, maybe to share with the uh, the audience here just about how you kind of view multi-cloud maybe then, if that's changed any now in your new expanded roles outside of AWS? Yeah, uh, well, I, it actually was not a taboo. That was, it's funny, we did talk about that. I think everybody kind of feels that way, but you know, if you're working, the reality is if you're working in enterprises and you're working with multinationals, what you tend to find, also any regulated industry, Brian, you tend to find that these corporations or governments want to be on-prem and multi-cloud. Uh, and, and it's just the nature. And, and it's funny because when I started the AWS business, one of the things that we actually had always said is we knew that we were opening up a really big market. And you probably remember in 2010, when I first came from Microsoft AWS, people really didn't know what cloud computing was. I think I told you the story that I, I had been on Capitol Hill many times that when I went up the first few times with Amazon uh, and said, hey, I'm here with our with our policy director, uh, Shannon Kellogg. I said, we're here. And they said, oh, are you here to talk about books or taxes? And we're like, uh, neither. I want to talk about cloud computing. And truly, in 2010, most congressional leaders still were not aware what cloud computing was. So it was very early days. You see how far we've come. But but. What we were mostly after, believe it or not, was getting our, our, our businesses, our customers, our agencies to use cloud. And part of the problem was they didn't even know how to use one cloud, let alone multi-cloud. So, so, the, so the reason I say that is we've come a very long way. Customers have gotten a lot more sophisticated. They now are having a choice on the types of workloads. And the one thing that we always prided ourselves with and with my customers was having choice. And that was the reason we had so many features and functions was some people didn't like that either, but no one workload is the same. There's no workload that's, that is exactly the same. And that's the reason, Brian, it's important to have a choice of compute, a choice of storage, a choice of databases. And if you go back, that's not really changed that much because you, you had competition from Sun and 
Oracle and Microsoft and all. So, you know, you're kind of back, but, but, the, but the key for the consumer or the enterprise's choice at the end of the day, and what will always happen is that the best solution or product will win. And key to that is having that great partnership with your customer to help them achieve what they really need to achieve. No, that's that's a great um, kind of view on that. Uh, it kind of reminds me back to one of the first conversations that I had with Dave Levy, uh, still over at AWS, and you know it was around similar options where you know what if you built the best cloud platform, that cloud platform is going to continue yes. to evolve, and uh, that was the bet that AWS you know was making. I think is still continuing to make today, uh, and for different customers with different workloads, different needs, you know, having those choices are you know super important. I think uh, to, to to just you know unlock that innovation potential. Yes, um, and, and I'll just share, Brian. Interestingly, years ago, I don't know how many people on here remember Karen Evans, who was the federal CIO back in the day. He was amazing. But even then, we were doing really creative things. When I was at Microsoft, we did something called the uh, Federal Desktop Core Configuration. And that was because users were, they needed to lock down that operating system. And, and still today at the time, though, that most 90% plus of the government was using Microsoft as an OS. And it was their way of saying, what's the controls that should be required? And that federal desktop core configuration was put together. We gave it to NIST and the agencies and or partners could download it. So you fast forward that today and you're doing the same kind of thing with different architectures with controls at with FedRAMP now in the cloud that many of us are way too familiar with. <laughs> no, um, no, exactly. And, it, you know, I think it's funny with cloud, it's, it's an evolution, like you said earlier, of, of just technology kind of getting to that next level. Um, may, maybe shifting a little bit, I'm curious, you know, from your view, um, what, what do you think is maybe one of the bigger obstacles that, you know, now still today in 2022, that you find organizations that you talk with are still struggling with to fully unlock that potential in the cloud? I, I would say, believe it or not, it's changed a lot over the years. I mean, in the early days, uh, you know, we couldn't have any conversation because the customers and partners were not sh sure about security. So it used to be about security and they would say, you know, we can't use cloud because it's not secure. And when we you know, when we ended up going into the intelligence community, that really changed that in 2013. And people got much smarter about how they use cloud and the controls. And then what I found over the years is people were coming to the cloud as a result of security. But then it became acquisition vehicles. What were, you know, how did you, how did you acquire OpEx versus CapEx? And that was really challenging because of the way the agencies had budget or corporations. And that was an issue. And, you know, generally, I would say that's pretty much been worked through. There's all kinds of now cloud computing uh, contract vehicles, OTAs, different things that customers, even just professional services contracts that are dedicated just for cloud. We have research now in government that are just, you know, research programs. But when I look at, I think there's really, from my view, there's two big, big things. Uh, one is skills. We are still lacking skills. It is the number one thing that I hear from customers all the time is that, look, I don't have enough skills. And now we have this big, uh, you know, the resignation. They, they're saying, and, and it's people are changing jobs. And the reality of where we are in the technological revolution that we're in is that people do move, but then also the skills are not up to where they need to be because it's moving fast. I just did an AI talk this morning and I was, I was with a, uh, a private equity group last week having a conversation and they said, you know, anytime they needed to invest or want to invest in a blockchain technology company today, the reality was every engineer costs five hundred thousand dollars a year that they were hiring. So the cost of talent has really gone up, and then the amount of talent and the speed at which we continue to educate people, and so skills gap huge issue. And we can we, we can explore that a little bit more if you want. And the second big thing is it is in the public sector side, it is very hard to break the government of what I kind of call the beds and seats contracts, where, you know, it's so easy to go try to get people 
to do a particular uh, mission when you should really be looking toward automation and technology software to solve a lot of those problems that we talked for many years about the democratization of technology and how that should help both uh, enterprises, consumer and governments move faster. And the, the, the evolution of all these tools like machine learning and artificial intelligence is really only the result of actual cloud computing being available today for scale, for processing, you know, compute storage and, and uh, the massive processing needed, but you have got to have the skills. So skills, and then I would say just getting enterprises to understand how they really take advantage of those tools so they have the right people doing these roles that move the skill set up the ladder versus just a bunch of individuals kind of uh, that you have on contract in case you need them. And that that's two. And then the third, I would say, is a sense of urgency that we really need uh, in, in, our, in our government. You see what's going on today around the world with the Ukraine, with Russia, cybersecurity attacks at a level we've ne never seen them before. Uh, the bad actors that get uh, more tactically smart about how they do what they do. And so there's never been a time like now that we need to modernize and update our, our technology, our skills, and also turn to software and utilize it in the way that we need, because we've got to stay number one. And let's face it, we have the best technology uh, capabilities in the world in the United States, and we don't want to we don't want to stray away from that. No, that's, um, I, I, first off, you hit on a lot of things that we hear as well from, you know, the folks that we're talking with, um, and, and a lot of things that we're, we're helping to evangelize as well, especially with the focus on automation, the focus on getting out of, you know, the minutia and being able to give people that need to operate, run, automate, and optimize their cloud environments, the right tools at the right level, that they can just kind of take that and run with it. Um, I, I did want to pull the thread though on the skills side of things. So, um, you know, obviously I am sure that out of the folks that are joining us here today, there's people that are just saying, if I only had more cloud engineers, if I only had more solutions architects, uh, any any words of, of wisdom or advice that you've seen or examples, again, to share um, with this community about, you know, orgs that have done it right, um, that have been able to kind of build and grow that, that, that talent base to get them to that next level um, and, and some of the lessons that they've been able to achieve. Well, it, it's interesting because one of the greatest sayings that, that I still love that we had at Amazon Web Services, services there was no, it, there was no compression algorithm for experience. It's still, it wasn't my saying, it was an engineer so long ago. I was like, that's like the best saying because it's really about experience and setting a goal that you work backwards from, Brian. And it's, so, so when you're going through this modernization, this digital transformation, it takes number one leadership at the top. Somebody that says we are going in that direction. Number two, you have to set guidelines and timeframes of when you're going to accomplish moving your applications and having imported and optimized and modernized. And, and that's part of it all. You're either going to build new ones or you're going to move and you're going to move those. You're going to lift and shift. You're going to optimize and then do more modernization on it. So you get all those capabilities. So with all those in mind, you have to go through and do a skill sets mapping. And we did it so many times for every customer on what do you need as you go through that. And it's really, there's so many tools and resources out there. You know, Amazon Web Services has over 600 free online courses. Um, Microsoft has amazing free online courses. Uh, Google, you have edX that you can go to. Uh, you know, if you want to do something a little bit more formal, we started the first two-year cloud computing certificate in Northern Virginia Community College. And when you go do that, every college now then in Virginia accepts that and you go right into a four-year degree. Uh, so, so you can do a lot of this stuff virtually and have a lot of hands-on online. But honestly, it is about experience. It's about setting the goals working backwards to get those done and having that experience. And, and I can tell you right now, I'm no longer there, but 
I know that Microsoft, Amazon, and or Google, any of these cloud providers are more than willing to help their customers make sure that they get there in the right fashion. And that's what so many of my great partners did too, Brian, partners like you that did, that helped with that guidance with the customers on what direction to take. But I would say, you know, it takes, it takes a team of doing it, but it's focused to get you there. But, but uh, it's very possible. I saw so many customers doing it. And uh, those that at the leaders at the top that said, we're doing it, we're going to evaluate ourselves and then we're going to check ourselves and we're going to celebrate the success as we get there. No, that's, that's, uh, that's great. And just those practical tips too, uh, for the folks that are local to mid Atlantic to know about, you know, just some of the, the university programs are great too. Uh, and you know, for the folks that are, are watching later, you're going to hear again from indeed, uh, where some of the things that Teresa mentioned about, you know, how, you know, partnering with AWS, um, with them, we, we did an awesome day, uh, to really unlock a lot of the folks that, we're new to the cloud at Indeed and being able to partner with them to help sponsor that. And then also to see just the, the, the folks that want to get exposure to the cloud. Again, the cloud providers are there to also help. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, it's just asking, uh, just asking the question. Sure. So, um, but no, that's, that's great. Um, I did want to encourage folks. We got a couple more minutes here with Teresa. If there are any questions that anyone has, I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and put those in the Q and A. Uh, option here in Zoom. Um, I, I'll, I'll ask you one one more question that I've got on on my list. You know, kind of similar. Uh, any trends in the past couple of years that surprised you uh, that this happened now in the cloud? Anything that's kind of jumped out that you you really didn't think probably in 2022 we, we we'd be seeing these types of things happen in the cloud? I will I will share. You know, in my business and public sector, we were seeing you know. It's funny, people like to say governments move kind of slowly, but in the cloud, I think we were a great example of a business where the governments were moving really quickly and they're big. People forget how big just the U.S. federal government is. I mean, they spend a hundred billion dollars almost a year on IT and let's not forget, that doesn't count mission or intelligence workloads. So when you combine all those, the U.S. federal government is massive in terms of how much they do. That's the reason we're all part of that community. But, you know, honestly, Brian, customers around the world, state and local governments and governments around the world were moving fast. I saw a lot of innovation in five years, but what I was not prepared for was what COVID would do to speed that up. And it was unbelievable. Myself and my team and all my time at Splunk, it was so busy with the governments, because remember, governments could not shut down. Unlike a lot of other groups, governments had to keep going. They were looking, they had to communicate with their citizens. They had to determine what was going on with COVID. They had to do the research, help to get those vaccines moving. They had to get them distributed. There was a lot of work, PPP. And this was, you had that same uh, model going on around the world. And what happened was that governments and then enterprises started doing the very same thing. They could not wait. They could not get into those data centers anymore. They had to build. And I saw so many new applications being built. That was like, you know, customers say, we'll do that in two years or three years. And they speed it up. They did it quickly. And it was a forcing function. So uh, I know I saw my business really explode. And it was, it was humbling to see what, what actually the customers could do when pushed. So uh, that was probably the big trend, just seeing the speed, which now today, I think we're all kind of benef benefiting from that as you know, partners to our customers to speed that up. And the second big thing is how much more rapidly we saw machine learning and AI take shape. I mean, the amount of companies that have popped in and are doing real modeling and using that data. And the, the other big trend kind of uh, in parallel to that is getting data structure in order. You are seeing companies and governments work really hard to get that structure in place because you don't have the right structure with your data. You cannot really use AI and machine learning the way you want to, because remember get, getting those models going can be complex. So the data has to be in place. And then last thing I'll just say is again, we heard a lot about blockchain. It kind of went away. And now because of crypto and everything happening around that, 
you are seeing the whole, now this is moving up, the, you're, it's moving up again. You're seeing blockchain. Last but not least, everything around ESG where we're having to track, uh, you know, how much energy we're using. I don't think that's a trend that will go away. You're going to see new technologies come on the forefront that are going to be looking at climate and the use of energy and power. And we're all not going to be happy that we have to track it, but we're going to have to track it. And then cyber's never changing. We got to watch out for the bad actors all the time. We need more cybersecurity. Awesome. No, that's that's great. Um, uh, Matt, uh, maybe uh, I don't know if there's some Absolutely. questions coming yeah, in been- here. Yeah, I was just about to say, we'd be getting a few questions in both the chat and the Q&A. One that's come in, um, you know, what do you see as the biggest obstacle in innovating in the cloud? Well, I, like, like I was saying, the obstacle to innovating is really having, there's, there's not an obstacle in terms of access. This is one of the best things about cloud. You have free tiers, pretty much with all the vendors, free tiers, the ability to try things. Uh, you know, that experimentation is one of the biggest benefits that we never had in the past with, with a more traditional client server model. But it's still, I would say, it is, it is skills and that capability of, of, um, of the individuals that understand how to use it. But, but the innovation, it's, it's a good question, but I don't see a lot of barriers for innovation in the cloud because you have that. It's like the place to do that experimentation and like I said, if you don't know, please, please, I encourage you to go uh, and I'll pass them to Brian. I bet he's got them, but I'll pass some sites for him to pass on to you. But there's some great locations to go and do free training and education online that will help you sandbox and get going. No, it's, that's extremely powerful. And, you know, again, I think uh, it, it's something where, again, the cloud has offered so much potential for organizations, again, I think as you said earlier, Teresa, like of just all sizes to, you know, think and act like us as a startup, right? You know, yes. you can get amazing services and not have to worry about, you know, you don't have the person on staff that's built a face recognition algorithm. Guess what? There's Amazon recognition out there. There's equivalent services in Google and, and, and Microsoft that you can tap into if you're a developer and you can just hit an ATI and then pay based on the usage there. And like those are, are just really neat things that I think that it's awesome when we start to see so many organizations, large and small leverage, um, like you said, innovation. Uh, the cloud's not the obstacle. It's, it's yeah. the people to the it, cloud is the obstacle. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, if you, again, I hate to go back to COVID because we're kind of still living it, but without the, the cloud and the, the massive compute and processing, we would have never gotten to the vaccinations as fast as we did. In the modeling, I talked to so many healthcare startups and you know, individual researchers during COVID and some, you know, the stories over and over about the use of cloud. And just one example, one group that we worked with said that if they they were looking at lung x-rays to determine, you know, what was the results, what was the impact of COVID on the lungs. And they said one, evaluating one x-ray for this would have taken like two weeks and they could do 10,000 in like four hours using algorithms and AI. So this is kind of the power of that innovation. And this is an old story that probably people are tired of me telling, but it's just one of my favorites because it was so early. In 2012, we went to NIH and got a copy of the Thousand Genome (coughs) Project and no one could access that. You have to understand, you couldn't just go as an individual researcher and go access that that data and do your research. You had to go put that information somewhere. And so only large companies or governments or large education institutions could access it. We brought it over, put it on the cloud for free, opened it up, talked about the first week we got 3,400 new researchers crowdsourcing that. So remember they accessed it for free they started putting their accounts, they started looking at it, exploring it, where they could have never even gotten to it. There's been thousands and thousands of research, new research papers. Now, we've moved on. That is very old data. We've learned so much. It's, I'm even embarrassed to kind of talk about it, but it's a good example of how quickly you could innovate on a data set. And then we, then we put thousands of data sets up for, for individuals or researchers. It was about 
access to information and data so you can do your work. Yeah, and, and I think with that, you know, just knowing that, uh, you know, in some cases, you know, there wasn't a need to buy infrastructure to get there, right? It was, you know, you can build on, or sorry, we had to build that. It was really something you just buy and, and it would just be, uh, you know, again, by the, the usage and by the hour, just, it, I think That's it's right. incredible when, you know, you can get to that point where, um, you know, again, the access is, is right there. It's just, just empowering it. This is, uh, so true. But, yeah, now, Teresa, this has been a great conversation and I'm sure we could probably talk for the rest of the couple yes, hours I here. Uh, but I really sincerely appreciate you taking the time out to do this event and speak to our, uh, again, customers, partners, and, and, and other cloud professionals here today. Uh, and uh, again, just really appreciate the time. Hopefully we can you. have you back sometime and we'll continue the conversation. Yeah, thanks everybody. Enjoy your day. And Brian and team, thanks so much for the invitation. Take care, everyone.